Hey, all of you Warhammer 40k terrain builders, D&D diorama people, just plain crafty folks. Dayland with another random making encounter. I've always wanted to take one of those magnetic levitation things and sort of deconstruct it and use the guts to make something different. Now, I found the cheapest possible Earth Globe one that I could find, ordered that, and then got it and was starting to try and tear it apart and realized basically it was all just glued and welded together and just no way it was going to ever come apart without totally destroying the thing. And I felt kind of bad because it was kind of not terrible and I didn't want to make a total mess of it and destroy it and waste the money that I spent. So, undeterred, I jumped over onto eBay and found this. So this is the core. This is the, these are the guts that make the magnetic levitation happen. That and one little magnet thing. So what I want to do is take this core and incorporate it into a piece of terrain and see if I can make something kind of unusual with it. Now, this is my first time using these magnetic levitation things. I'm not really sure what the limitations are or what you know, sort of the gotchas are going to be. So hopefully it works out. If it doesn't, I already have a second idea for another project that I think could work out really well. So more to come on that one. But first, let's just see how badly I can destroy this first project. Let's jump into it. <laughs> Simply put, these levitation things are a series of super magnets that are wanting to suck this center super magnet to themselves. But the coils, the electromagnets in the center are very carefully balancing and pushing away the magnet. The one thing that's important to note is there's really only about an inch distance there. So we need to be really careful with how much garbage we put between the top of the magnets and the bottom of the thing that we're levitating. So one of the first things I really needed to do was build a spacer to embed the electromagnetic or the magnetic levitation element into. The base is half inch MDF, and I did drill a hole in the center for heat dissipation. There are some power MOSFETs that drive those electromagnets, and I'm not sure how much heat they're going to generate, so I didn't really want to trap it all in this foam thermos insulation ring that I'm creating. I'm just using a thin sheet of mat board for the top. Again, really wanting to minimize the amount of material between the top of the magnets and the diorama. I'm really just hacking away at it with my cheapy hot wire foam cutter. Uh, nothing really too dramatic here. It's going to be covered with sculpt mold in a minute, so just generally roughing it out. For the center floating part, I started with this really massive thing. Uh, the idea was that all of my figures were going to be sitting on it. In the end, you'll see that I used about a tenth of this because really it just ultimately looked pretty stupid and I had to change my idea pretty midstream or actually a little bit further along. It wasn't a problem supporting the weight, so it can support a fair amount of weight. I'm using some plaster rocks that are just cast from Woodland Scenics rock molds. No endorsement, but I do love their rock molds. And just carving out some areas on sort of the face of the diorama, but nothing's ever completely dead center or 100% in the middle. You can see that they're sort of canted a little bit, maybe 10, 15 degrees off of center. With dioramas and just 
sculpting, making in general, it's really a good idea to have some asymmetry to it. I think we as humans are very symmetrical creatures, loving symmetry, and we have to sort of fight that in our terrain building. Sculptamold is a great product. There's a bunch of things out there like Sculptamold, but the one thing to keep in mind is to work in small batches. Sculptamold is plaster of Paris with fiber paper mixed in. So once that plaster starts to set, you've really got 5, 10 minutes, 15 minutes maybe to work with the Sculptamold before it becomes too hard to work. So small batches. One thing that's really nice about it is that as it does start to set, you can actually go in and do some smoothing and get some pretty reasonable sculpting. Now, I wouldn't say this is reasonable sculpting. I'm not really sure what this looks like. I had an idea, but it ultimately looked like something you don't want to step in in a field. And once I was done putting the burnt umber base coat, uh, I really just ultimately reinforced that uh, feeling that this was something that was dropped out of the rear end of a cow. Um, it gets better, but I was really questioning my sculpting skills here at this point. When I start to put my texture, my terrain on, I always start with the largest material first, the biggest rocks. When you think about nature, big boulders, big rocks, those are the things that are, when they're on the surface, they're, they sort of settle into the material around it. Sand, silt, dirt, all sort of flows in and fills the cracks and crevices. So I always want to start with the heaviest materials, the biggest materials, and then generally work in those thinner, lighter things so that everything feels embedded. These are not special materials. This is stuff just scrounged from the craft store. They're used for, I think, floral arrangements and things like that, sand art. Now, this part is uh, borrowed from Luke over at Boulder Creek Railroad. This is just dirt from the yard, and it's been sifted, and I'm using some matte Mod Podge to adhere it, and I'm just sifting it onto the base. Now, here's where you see what I ended up with from that levitation floating part. I basically just ripped all of this material off and chucked it. Uh, it it's the lesson here is really never be afraid to radically change your ideas even after you've done a bunch of work. And this happened a couple times in this project. Now, I should have probably painted all of the rocks first, uh, rather than putting the dirt in. However, one thing to kind of note is that all of that dirt, all of the rocks, those are currently just texture. So I use those materials for texture and then all of the color comes from painting. So even the dirt is literally painted. So rocks are really just a matter of starting with a dark gray and then dry brushing lighter shades and tones of gray you want to have a little bit of variability, a little bit of sort of anything from taupe colors to reddish colors into your gray base. And I layer a lot, maybe too much. So I usually will brush and then do a wash and then dry brush and then do a wash and kind of rinse and repeat until I've either way overworked the surface or I've decided that it's as good as it's ever going to get. Now I'm going to move on to sort of the fun part is building the elements that tell the story. The idea was that this was some sort of a ruined bunker or building and so I wanted to lay some cobblestone or some rocks down for the base. I busted out my 
expanded foam blocks and tiles and cubes that I've cut and weathered. This is another area that you'll see in the final I changed radically. It's not a stone wall in the final. It looks more like a concrete bunker. And so again, this was a lot of work, a lot of painting. I dry brushed all of the rocks. And then ultimately that stone wall area in the middle, I ripped out, built a new thing that looked more like a concrete blockhouse and put that in its place. So again, you know, if it's not feeling right, it's okay to change it. Washing in, filling in all the nooks and crannies, going back and then dry brushing. It was important to try to find a differentiation in the grays between stone and natural materials so not everything looks all homogenous. I added some tufts and a little bit of uh, turf. Not too much. This is a blasted war terrain. Adding some barbed wire that I created. If you're interested in seeing how I make barbed wire, post a note down in the comments. You can see the blockhouse area now. The middle part was a little flat. I wanted it to feel like there was more depth in the middle, like it was a little ambiguous how deep that hole was. And so to solve for that, I darkened that area and then used a little bit of UV cure resin to look like it was a puddle of water that it sort of filled in. So it made it a little bit more ambiguous just how deep that center part goes. Now is the real fun part. And that is putting on all the little nernies and greebles that really bring the scene to life. So no battle scene is, you know, finished without some skulls. Um, you know, we've got some Xeno skulls and some human skulls and, you know, just all sorts of crazy things going on. And I'm just using little dabs of PVA to hold everything in place, sort of, kind of there. That one didn't want to really stay put. And just stacking them and putting them in random places. Again, avoid that idea of aligning and symmetry and everything sort of stacked in the right spot. At this point, it's fairly done. Um, I've added a banner and you can see that I've also added a little bit of texture to that water just using some gel medium or a water texture to just break up that surface of the really really smooth resin. The banner was actually just made by printing some um, a design on a regular inkjet printer. I had a part that I used for the, the top of the banner staff. Here are my figures that I'm using. Now I'm not some uber uh, Warhammer painter. I'm trying, I'm getting better, I think. But uh, now it was time to actually really bring this home and put the characters in their place. It was important to plan where they were going so they had places to mount and stand. And I had to do a little bit, as usual, some hacking to, to create spaces for them because even though I just said it's important to plan, I didn't plan. The final figure needs to be balanced well on the magnetic levitation part. The electronics that drive this will build up funky spinning and oscillation if that top piece is radically unbalanced. With the final character glued in place, the scene is set where the forces of chaos have lifted a chunk of the battlefield with our leader standing on top.